God, I, I'm so grateful for this congregation. So grateful for the time that we have to gather together as your people to worship you in spirit and in truth. Grateful for the opportunity we have to gaze upon you and remember the inheritance that we have to come, the inheritance that our loved ones who have passed away before are experiencing now. And so we bring that bitter sweetness to you and we thank you and we worship you and we ask for your help to run the race that we have to the day that you return or the day you take us home. God, as we get into your word today, will you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand what you would have us to do? God, we want to be your people here in, in Jackson County. We want to be your representatives and your ambassadors. We want to encourage one another until the day that we see you return in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be wrapping up our Jesus, a true and better sermon series in just a couple weeks, okay? Uh, so in this sermon series, we started with Adam. We're going to get, make our way all the way to Jesus to see the big picture of God's redemptive story. Well, if you were here last week, we talked about Jesus is a true and better David. So if we got to get from David to Jesus in just a couple weeks, we're going to be covering big swaths of history, especially today. So if you like history, today is your day. If you don't, maybe you'll like it a little bit more after today. I don't, I don't know about that, but I hope you do. So we are going to dive right in uh, to the story because we've got a lot of things to cover, and, um, and we're going to end up kind of in the same place that we just were a, a couple minutes ago because as we look at today, we're going to look at Jesus is a, is a true and better Jeshua, okay? Sometimes they call him Joshua, but in order to differentiate him between Joshua who conquered Jericho and Jeshua, who we're talking about today, we're going to use that E in it, the Jeshua. We're going to look at how Jesus is a true and better Jeshua because he is the eternal king and he is our forever high priest. But we've got some history to cover before we get there. So put your imagination caps on. We're going back to uh, you know, 1500 or so BC uh, to the time of King David. And uh, we're going to start from there and we're going to go through um, a failed kingdom, but a faithful king. So remember last week, we talked about King David, what well, was before he was king, that he really was the archetype of the king to come. He was the one that didn't rely on his own strength, but relied on the strength that came from above. Remember, he's fighting against Goliath, and he's like, you may have all the weapons, all the experience, and everything that you need, but there is a God in Israel. And he's not only, only going to allow me to defeat you, but we're going to defeat this whole Philistine army. Why? So that everybody here and everybody out there knows that God is God. And it is not by swords or spears that the battle is won, but the battle is the Lord's. And David later becomes king, and he's a great king. He really is. He's, he's the greatest king of Israel. And God gives him this promise. You see, David wanted to build a temple. And God said, you're not going to be the one to build a temple, but your son is going to be the one to build a temple. And David, I'm giving you this promise. I, I took you from the shepherd field, but you are going to have a son on the throne forever. So he gave David this promise of this eternal dynasty, so to speak. And, and he said, you know what, even if your son is, he does his own thing and, and walks away, like there's going to be punishment and consequences, but I'm not going to remove my love from him like I did from Saul because of you, David, because of the promise I've made to you. And David didn't get everything right. Like, he was a great king. But there's this, this huge kind of blemish in his life where he, he sins with a lady named Bathsheba, commits adultery with her, murders her husband by sending him to the front line so that he can cover it up and marry her. And it was, it was ugly and it was bad. And he is confronted in that and he is repentant and he, he's forgiven. But some of the consequences of that, like the rest of his life, like his family's in turmoil, there's violence, he kind of has to go in exile for a little bit because one of his other sons takes over. And, and the rest of his life is not this prime example of everything. But we do see God's faithfulness in the midst of it. And, and his son Solomon later becomes king. And, and underneath Solomon, like the, the, it really, there's just flourishing. Like it's the biggest the kingdom ever is. Uh, Solomon was so wealthy and so rich. Uh, the scriptures say that silver was like worthless. Like nobody made anything out of silver because it was as common as the stones. He had 660 talents of gold that was delivered every year. I don't know if I have that in pounds. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll find it when I get to there in my notes. 25 tons of gold imported every year. Okay. He was a really rich, wealthy dude. He made the temple. He built the temple. He built this big palace and everything. And we see like, man, like everything seems to be coming together. Like it's this glorious kingdom. It's never going to end. But that trajectory doesn't continue forever. 
You see, in the book of Deuteronomy, when, when God gave the law to Moses, he said, there's going to be a time when you want a king. And if you're going to have a king, here's some things they need to remember. He says, every king needs to have a handwritten copy of the law. Like, they write down God's law. They read it, they copy it for themselves, so that they have that initial time of going through it, writing it down, and then they need to be in God's word, because they need to be leading the people God's way. And then he also said they're not supposed to accumulate a bunch of wealth, okay, more than likely, because when you have a lot of wealth, it can be really easy to trust in, ah, I've got this stockpile, everything's going to be okay. He also said they're not supposed to accumulate a lot of chariots and horses, and don't go to Egypt to get the best horses. I told you not to go back to Egypt. It's not about trusting in horses and chariots and, and all the things you need for battle. It's about trusting in the Lord. And it's also they're not supposed to accumulate an abundance of wives because if they marry women from the other nations and they bring their gods and goddesses with them, it's going to turn the heart of the king and the heart of the nation away. Those are like the three main things given. And we look at Solomon, 25 tons of gold imported every year. He had thousands of chariots and horses. And where did he buy his horses from? Egypt. Okay, this is, this is the most mind-blowing fact. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines. Solomon was not following God's law and the rules that he gave to his, his people. Now, during his reign, it was a time in the most prosperous time of Israel. There was peace on every side. But we see that the ladies that he married that worshipped other idols, he made places for them to worship. And eventually he worshipped the idols that they worshipped. And so God, uh, we, we pick up uh, a verse in the book of 1 Kings, where it says that the Lord became angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, like two times in his life, God had appeared to Solomon. Although God had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So get this. The Lord said to Solomon, Since this is your attitude, and you have not kept my covenant... Oh, hold on, let's see. Uh, there we go. You have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you. I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. That sounds a lot like what God, through Samuel, said to Saul. So you have not obeyed me, so I'm tearing the kingdom away from you. I'm going to give it to somebody else. In between the lines, we know David, a man after my own heart, who I can trust to do my will. He'll do everything I want him to do. Solomon, because you have disobeyed me, I'm tearing the kingdom away from you. But there's hope in the midst of the consequence. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, for the sake of the promise that I gave to David, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but I'll give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. So because Solomon fell away from the Lord in the middle of his life, now there's evidence that he came back, okay, as we see in the Proverbs that, that he wrote, as we see in the book of Ecclesiastes, where it's like, I pursued all these things that I thought would bring me pleasure and wisdom, and none of it did until I realized that the whole of life is about living for God and seeking to do things his way. And be faithful in what he's called me to. But after Solomon has died and passed away, his son named Rehoboam became king. And the people came to Rehoboam and they said, it was really hard under Solomon. Like it was prosperous, but it was hard. Like it took seven years to build the temple, 14 years to build his palace. There was all these things going on. Like we worked so hard. Solomon worked just so hard. Will you relent? And Rehoboam said, let me talk to my advisors about it. I'll get back to you in a week or three days. I don't remember what it said, okay? So he goes and he talks to his advisors. The guys that had advised his father, Solomon, what should I do? They said, if you, if you give in to them, if you ingratiate yourself to them, they will be your people forever. Like if you are kind to them, you listen to them, like they, they'll, they'll honor you and, and you'll rule them for your whole life. And he's like, okay, well, maybe. Then he goes and talks to his advisors his own age. Okay, what do you think I should do? And they're like, you know what? I think you should say something kind of like this. And this is what he said. He said, um, my pinky is wider, is bigger than my dad's waist. Like if you thought it was bad under him, just watch out. If you thought that he whipped you with whips, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. Like you thought you worked so hard under him, pff, it's going to be even harder under me. And so 10 of the tribes were like, we're out of here, goodbye. And they made their own king, King Jeroboam. Okay, so we have Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Okay, I don't know why, Boam. I don't know what Boam means, but apparently it was a kingly name. So 10 of the tribes became what is called 
Israel. Okay, we can see it up here. So the northern kingdom of Israel is the ten tribes that do not include Judah, which was the tribe of David, and Benjamin, which interestingly enough was actually King Saul's tribe. So it's interesting that that's the tribe that stuck with Judah. So for the next 350-ish years, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, okay, there is a king in Judah down here who is King David's son or grandson, his, his descendant, and they rule for the next 350, 400 years. But the northern kingdom of Israel quickly fell away from worshiping the one true God. Because you see, the king didn't want his people to travel down to Jerusalem, which was in Judah, in order to worship God at the temple. So he made idols for them to worship. Hey, these, these two golden calves, this is Yahweh. Kind of sounds like the golden calves from Exodus, right? And so about 350 years in the kingdom of Israel, there is not one good king. And the two kingdoms exist side by side, sometimes in war, Sometimes in peace where they're together, but often just conflict, even if it wasn't war, okay? They were brothers, but they were divided. And like I said, there was not one good king from Israel. There was nine different dynasties, 19 different kings, and the, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, continued to walk away from God, forsake him, forget God. And so about 350 years later, the Assyrian army, you can kind of see where Assyria is over here, up here where all the arrows kind of point to in Nineveh. The Assyrians came down into this box here. That's where um, Jerusalem and Israel, the northern kingdom was. And, and they conquered them. And Assyria is very brutal in their conquering. And their kind of thing, what they would do is they would conquer people and they'd take them, take them back, and then they'd scatter them all around. And so the ten tribes of Israel kind of scattered around the known world so that they wouldn't have this unique identity together. And, and they're scattered around and... And we move kind of to the, the land of uh, Judah. You see, during that time, Judah had a man who was David's descendant on the throne. Again, there's 19 kings in that 400 or some years. There were some good kings, some really, really bad kings, and most of them just weren't all that great. And none of them, not even the best kings, like of all the kings, even the best ones, it says, but he wasn't quite like David, a man after God's own heart. And so after about 400 years of continuing to reject God and not listen to the prophets and after bad king followed bad king followed bad king, uh, a new superpower kind of arose in the world. The center of the, of the Middle East wasn't up there and Assyria was down here in Babylon. And so the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar starts kind of knocking, not knocking, okay, <laughs> knocking on the door of Judah. And in the book of Jeremiah, there's this prophecy given to the second to the last king of Judah. His name was Jeho uh, Jehoachin, okay? Get this. His name was Jehoachin, son of Jehoiakim. They were very, very um, unique names back there, okay? Listen to what he says. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my right hand, I would still pull you off. Like if you were on my hand as a signet ring that represented me, which guess what? That's what they were supposed to do, be representatives of God. Even if you were that ring, I would still pull you off and I will hand you over to those who seek your life, to those that you fear, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon and the Babylonians. I will hurl you and the mother who gave you birth into another country where neither of you was born and there you will both die. You will never come back to the land you long to return to. So I want you to remember that picture of God saying, even if you were the signet ring, I would take you off and cast you aside to the enemy because you have continued to reject me. For generations you've been rejecting me, and it's time. Now this wasn't something that was just brand new. Like in the book of Deuteronomy, there was this warning given. If in the promised land you reject me and forsake me, enemies will come and exile you away. They'll take you away from the land I promised Abraham. And you'll go into exile. But... If in that land I take you into, that they take you into, if you remember me and you repent and you seek my face, then I will bring you back. And so the kingdom, the southern kingdom of, of Judah is, is exiled and there's no king of the line of David in Judah. And we think, what happened? Like what about God's promise? David, you will not fail to have a son on the throne. And now they're exiled away. But there's hope in the midst of exile. You see, Jeremiah said this. He was a prophet during that time. 
This is what he's saying to the exiles that had been taken out of Judah into Babylon. You can kind of see the journey that they had to go on. So they were here in that green part at the bottom. Babylon's over there in that uh, star. They would not go straight across because that is a desert. Traveling the desert, not a very good thing to do. So they'd kind of follow, go up the Mediterranean Sea, over across by the rivers and down to Babylon. And when they were there, Jeremiah said this to them. This is what the Lord Almighty... The God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what you're supposed to do in your time of exile. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give them daughters in marriage. So that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in the number there. Do not decrease. Verse 7. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams they encourage you to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. You see, there were prophets in, that were there in exile that they told the Israelites, Hey, God's going to bring you back. Okay, he's going to be faithful to his promise. You're going to come back like right now. So don't settle down because you're going to go back. And Jeremiah, God through Jeremiah is saying, Time out. I have not sent those people. You will be there for 70 years. For a lot of people, that's the rest of their life. For some people, they may be born there and die there. There's going to be the whole generation that's going to die out. Most of that generation that were kids are going to die out, and it's going to be the grandkids or the great-grandkids that are going to come back. And, And here's one of the gleanings that we can get in the midst of this, okay? He says, as you live in exile, like, live the life. Build houses, plant gardens, solidify yourself there. Pray for the prosperity of the place that you're in because when it's blessed, you'll be blessed. Live your life among the people that don't know me. You know, that's a picture of the Christian life, right? As Christians, this world is not our home. We're not going to find our full fulfillment here. We shouldn't. The world can't offer us everything. We're exiles and aliens. We're called to be God's people here, to represent Him to the world, to represent Him to the world, and to allow God to allow us to be a vessel of His blessings out to the world around us. That's some of why we do the community events that we do, because we we realize that we're put here, we're exiles and aliens, this is not our home, we have an inheritance to come, and we want to be a blessing that God pours into, out into our community. That's why we want to send and support missionaries, because guess what? Most of you aren't going to Papua New Guinea in the next six months or a year to go bring the word of God to people that have never heard it, right? But through our prayers and our support, there's people that are. And so that's we're called. We're exiles and aliens. We're called to represent God's people wherever we're at. And that's what Jeremiah had said to them. Settle down, settle in, live the life among a people that don't know me. And then he says this. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come back to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. I know my promises. I know the promise I I gave David. I know the promise I've given you as my people. I have not forgot it. I have not abandoned you. It will happen. But it's not today. But I'm still calling you to be faithful today. Verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Here here is um, a couple keys from that. God did not abandon his people when they were in exile. Period. God has not and will not abandon us. You see, uh, you know, scriptures have talked about, you know, uh, what, like our lifetime. Like sometimes that 70 years was used as like a lifetime, okay? Now, I know a lot of us here, you're past that, okay? That w- there's, we live longer now. But it's like we're in exile for our lifetime. Either the day when we die or when Christ returns. And we're called to live in the world that we are in, to represent God to be a vessel of God's blessing into the world and remember that in the midst of what we go through, the trials and the triumphs and the tears and the joys, God has not and will not abandon us. We are shielded in order to receive the inheritance that is coming. Period. Because you see, even in the midst of exile, there was a, 
this prophet Isaiah, who even before they went into exile, said, here's a word from the Lord. There's going to be a man named Cyrus. Cyrus is going to be my shepherd. He'll accomplish all that I please. And he's going to say this of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. Let, and let the temple foundations be laid. You see, there's hope in the midst of exile for the people. And so we get, 70 years later, they've been in exile. This is where we get the stories of like Daniel and the lions and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like people that were living in a foreign land, even like servants of a foreign king, but seeking to be ambassadors and missionaries different from the world and where they were at. I don't care what the law says about I can't pray to any other god or any other person but the king. Daniel says, I'm going to pray to God like I always have been. I'm going to let my light shine here. I'm not going to close the doors. I'm not going to hide. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to live as God's person here in Babylon. And we see God's faithfulness there. And we pick up the history of this in the book of Ezra. And here's what it says. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. You know the guy that had been prophesied about by Isaiah like years and years earlier? You see, the Babylonian kingdom had been conquered by the Persians. So now the Persians, it was kind of a combination. The Persians and the Medes, they had come together to conquer Babylon. And so in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make this proclamation. And this is what the proclamation was. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, earth, He's appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. So any one of his people among you, may God be with him, let him go to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who's in Jerusalem. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide them with silver and good, gold, goods and livestock, free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. This is mind-blowing. Seventy years after going in exile, Cyrus is like, God told me, I've got to build this temple in Jerusalem. So any Jews that are living in my, in my place, you can go back. And guess what? Any of your neighbors that aren't Jews, you can ask them for their stuff, for their gold and silver and, and their cattle and everything to take back to that promised land. He didn't say that, but your land, so that you have what you need. It's like, hey, I've rescued you out of Egypt. And you can ask your neighbors for their stuff and they're going to give you their gold and silver because I'm bringing you out. This is like the second great exodus. And so, 70 years later, the people get ready. But, but it, is, it doesn't end there, okay? So it says, The family heads of Judah and Benjamin, priests and Levites, <clears throat> everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, goods and livestock, valuable gifts, in addition to all free will offerings. And then this, this part blows my mind. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. So when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came in, he destroyed the temple and he took all the gold and silver out of it and he took it and put it in his own temples. And Cyrus says, I'm sending you back and here's all the stuff that was stolen from your temple. Take it back. 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 silver pans. Okay, it makes me think, like, did they lose one? Because 29, I don't know, okay? 30 gold bowls, 410 matching silver bowls, 1,000 other articles. So 5,400 articles of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar stole from the temple. Cyrus says, take them back, build a temple, whatever you need. Pay for it from my treasury. Go. So they did. And they went back. And, and we can kind of see here, like, this is now the Persian and Median Empire, okay? So they, they have all this land, but the Jews are mostly in this area around Babylon, and they are going to make this journey up and over to Jerusalem in order to build the temple. And they get there, and they start doing the work that God has given them to do. There's two men that, that led them back. One of them, his name was Zerubbabel, okay? I like that name. That's a fun name to say, Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel, guess what? Guess who his great, 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 great granddaddy was? Zerubbabel was in the, like, if, he, if they would have still been a nation, he would have been the king. And he set up as a governor there. And, and, and Jeshua, the man that went with him, like, his great, 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 much more greats, granddaddy was Aaron, the high priest. So we have the high priest and we have the man that would have been king if they could be a nation but is now the governor of Judah leading the people back and they get to work on the temple. 
And they rebuild the altar and they start worshiping God there. And, and they, build, they lay the foundation of the temple. And the day that they laid the foundation of the temple, there was this great uh, commotion among them. Because they're all there. And they're celebrating. They have, that God has brought them back. They laid the foundation of the temple. And there's rejoicing. And there's great weeping. Because you see the people that were kids and they saw the temple, they're weeping. Because they're like, it's so small. It won't be the same. But everybody else is rejoicing. And it says that the commotion was heard from miles around and you could not distinguish the, the shouts of joy from the weeping that was going on. You see, they went right to work, but there was opposition. You see, the people that had resettled in that area that weren't Jews didn't want them to be there. And so they, um, they got the work to stop. They sent letters to a new king of the, the Persian Empire and they said, you know what, king... These people are rebuilding the temple. And if you let them rebuild the temple, like, do you know the history of this land? There has been mighty kings that have lived in Jerusalem. And they're going to rebuild the temple, reestablish the city, and they're going to get their kings, and they're going to throw off your, your yoke. I'm just telling you, okay? Just telling you, okay? So the king makes them stop. And for 15 years, the work stops. And so it's in that time that God sends two men, Haggai and Zechariah, two prophets to encourage them in the work that they were given. And here's what Haggai said. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Again, sometimes they'll spell his name Joshua, okay? This is the same Jeshua, high priest, okay? This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Like, like, I sent you back to build my house, to build my temple, and you're saying it's not time because we're not allowed to. And Haggai, God through Haggai says this. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, the temple, remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it's turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields, and the mountains, and on the grain, and the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. So God is saying, look, I sent you back to build the temple. And you started out well. You made the altar. You made the foundation. And then, yeah, there, there's opposition but I sent you back to build the temple. And you have taken that opposition as a sign of, I guess it's not time. Let's focus on our own houses, our own stuff. And I don't think that God is saying, hey, you shouldn't build houses. You shouldn't make sure your family has a place to live, right? I mean, what did he tell them when they went into exile? Build houses. Okay, that's the first thing. Build houses, plant gardens, Settle down in. Like, so God's not saying, come back, only build a temple, don't have a place to live, don't plant gardens, don't care about... Okay, no. He's not saying that. But what he's saying is, I sent you back to build my house. When opposition came, you just gave in. And you said, okay, we'll put all our focus here. And God says, I've been trying to get your attention. Because you, you see, like, there's drought. And the, crowd, the crops aren't growing. And, and you have a... When you planted this much seed, expecting this much harvest, your harvest has been this much. You got this much money, thinking you could buy this much stuff, but when you reached in your pocket, it only bought you this much stuff. Why is it? Because you're neglecting the reason why I brought you back. To build my house. Because you see, that, that, the temple, that's like the, the center around their Jewish identity is. God's worship there. And... And they had, they had failed in that because they had been discouraged. They had faced opposition. Now, I have a question for you. How many of you have ever encountered opposition in your life and, and you have done kind of the same thing? Maybe thought like, well, maybe I've got to put my direction this way. Anybody ever been there? Or just me? Okay. And you know what? This, this takes wisdom, right? 
the Apostle Paul, he's like, I'm, I'm going to go this, into this country. And he's like, the door was closed. So I'm like, I'm going to go into this country. And the door was closed. Like, did that mean, like, no, he should just push through it and kept going? Well, from his life, we know, no, that wasn't it. Because he had a dream that a man from that country over there said, hey, we need the gospel. Come to us. And so Paul's like, I guess God's calling us there. Let's go there. So it takes wisdom for us to know when the opposition comes up, is that God saying, I'm, I'm closing this door and I'm opening up something over here, or is it the enemy that's saying, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to keep you back? I think some of the evidence here is what, why were they sent back? To build what? The temple. So if there's opposition there, I think God would say, how do you, how do you work through that? How do you fight through that? And so through the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, um, God comes to them and he challenges them. Like, this is a work I've given you to do. So do it. And, and this brings up a, a question, questions for us to ask. What is the work God is calling us to do in this time? I mean, that could be this like season around the holidays. It could be like our time on earth. It could be the time when our kids are in like you know, or, or toddlers in preschool, the time they're in elementary or, or junior and senior high, like whatever season of our life, small season, like this week, what's the job God has for me this week? What's the job that God has for me this, this year, my whole life? How are we about advancing his kingdom? When we talk about God's kingdom, it's like the place where he's reigning and ruling, like God's kingdom reign in my own life. Like where in my life is, is my own thoughts and actions and attitudes putting up blockers around what God wants to do in my life? Or I'm in the lives of those that are around us. And so I think questioning that God has for us that we can learn from um, Jeshua and from Zerubbabel is what is God calling us to do here and now? And maybe some of it is to fix those lights or something. I don't know. <laughs> but a question that I want us to look, God, what are you calling us now? Because we're called to represent, represent him to the world. In this time of Christmas, how can we Seek to use the opportunities where people are thinking about Christmas and maybe not in all the, you know, Jesus ways to draw the conversation. Like, hey, so like, we have that baby in the manger. What do you think about that baby? Like, what do you know about Jesus? Why do you celebrate Christmas? And we can connect with people and point people to Christ. Okay, back to the narrative here from Haggai. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. So after 15 years, they're like, we're in. We're going to do it. We're going to obey God, walk in that ministry he's given us. We're going to keep working on this, okay? And one month later, Haggai says this. God through Haggai. Tell Zerubbabel, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. Okay, get this. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, son of David, and I will make you like my signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. See, this is what God was saying through the prophet Haggai. God has not abandoned the work of his hands. He has not abandoned his promises. Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, son of King David, I will make you like that signet ring that I cast off. I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. We look in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah says, it's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit. Zerubbabel, Jeshua, you laid the foundation of the temple and you will put the capstone in because I am with you. By your power, by your might, by my spirit. We'll get the rest of the story next week. Or else we won't even have Sunday school today. So we may not get all the ways of how Jesus is a true and better Jeshua. But I want us to get this history. And I want us to see God's faithfulness to his people. Because the challenge for us is as we live in exile, it's not by your power, 
not by your mind. It's not about doing the best you can. It's not about pulling yourself by your, up by your own bootstraps. It's by the Spirit of God. We want to be empowered to live this Christian life. It's about realizing the gift that's been given to us. Forgiveness of sins. Not based on what we've done or will do. But given be, even though we don't deserve it. Freely to all who would believe. And it's out of that belief, out of that goodness of Jesus we sing about that we can rest and we find the strength to do the work God has called us. Now let me wrap up this part about the temple. They start building again. There's opposition, right? Hey, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Remember, we talked to the king and he sent letters back and he said that you had to stop. And they said, well, you know what? We don't care. I'm paraphrasing, okay? We don't care. King Cyrus, even before that king, he told us to come and do this. How about you go tell that king, hey, we're still doing this because King Cyrus said we could. How about you check your history records and then you give us an answer. And while we wait for that answer, guess what? We're working. And here's what King Darius sent back. He, he, found, he found like Cyrus's uh, command to go and build the temple. And I got to find this in my notes. Okay, here it is. Here is Darius's response to Tatanai, governor of that area, and Shethar Boznai, awesome names, okay? The people that were complaining, here's what he said. Do not interfere with the work of the temple of God. Because he found what Cyrus had said. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild the house of, the, of God on this site. Moreover, I hereby decree that what you are to do for the elders of the Jews in the construction of, of the house of God. Here's what you're to do. The expenses of these men are to be fully paid out of the royal treasury. From the revenues of your area that you are a governor, the trans-Euphrates, so that the work will not stop. Whatever is needed, young bulls, rams, male lambs, anything for burnt offerings to the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, oil, anything requested by the priests must be given to them daily without fail. So they may offer sacrifices pleasing to the God of heaven and pray for the well-being of the king and his sons. Furthermore, I decree that if anyone changes this edict, a beam is to be pulled from his house, he's to be lifted up and impaled on it for this crime. His house is to be made a pile of rubble. May God, who has caused his name to dwell there, overthrow any king or people who lifts a hand to change this decree or destroy this temple in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have decreed it. Let it be carried out with diligence. God gave them the work. They faced opposition. Let's, let's just do this instead. And God's like, no, I called you to this. Okay, we're in. We're going to do it. The opposition came. They said, no, no, we're going to obey God, not man. In fact, tell him, look in the records. They'll see why we can do this. Darius looks in the records, reads it, and he says, hey, governors had a complaint about this. Cyrus said they could do this. So I'm throwing my full weight behind it. And guess where all of their supplies are going to come from? It's going to come from your budget. You're going to give them whatever they need. And if anybody tries to change this law forever, or any king comes against this place of the temple, then... We're going to make your house into a pile of rubble and the main pole that, you know, that, the, that the roof is on will impale you on it. So get out of their way and let them do the work. Now what does this mean for us? Okay, We can maybe do half of our so what's. So let me get there in my notes. <clears throat> what kingdom are we living for today? You see, they faced opposition. They put all their focus and attention over here. And God says, that's not your main thing. This is your main thing. Who is God calling us to be in this time? His people. What is God calling us to do in this time? So here's a challenge I'll leave with you as Adam comes back up to finish out the service. In this season of your life, a season, like I said before, it can be short, it can be long, what are the ways that you can intentionally live out being Christ's person here in Jackson County. Maybe make it a little bit more personal. Christ's person in your home. With your grandkids. With your kids. Nieces, nephews. How about at work? How can we be God's people at work? Because you see, we're exiles and aliens. And we've been called to do something, right? Go into all the world. Make disciples, teach them everything I commanded, baptizing them. That's a commission we've been given. That's what our exile is to be about. Train up our kids, 
Love our spouses. Be a light. That's what God has given us. And here's the thing. It's not by power. It's not by might. But it's by God's Spirit. As we lean into Him, His promises, His word. Just look what He did. You all are going to pay for it. Get out of the way. Let them do the work. That's the God that we serve. Who seeks to strongly support those whose hearts are fully His. Lord, we thank you for today. God, I thank you for the example of, uh, even in the midst of a failed kingdom, that you are the faithful king. God, I pray that you will encourage us and challenge us of how can we be your people in our homes, in our workplaces, in our community, in our church. God, we want to represent you to the world. We want to be a shining light that the world sees and like, I, I need what you guys have. I, I need this community that you have, like that you love one another and you care for each other. Jesus, we're not going to be perfect in it. We aren't. We haven't even been perfect today and it's not even half over. But we realize it's not by power or might, but by your spirit. So Holy Spirit, enable us to do this. Strengthen us when we fail. Forgive us when we falter. Because you have defeated sin, hell, and death. We hold on to that. And we want to work heartily as unto you. So will you help us? In your name we pray. Amen.